Marcel Louis Jacques, David Dennis Jr., George Sedano. On the first ever game ending outfield assist double play in Major League Baseball playoff history. Just amazing. From every angle, amazing. Whether it's something that carries Atlanta, we'll talk about next. Let's go around the horn. Maybe something unprecedented will happen here today. You never know, though. Brian Anderson's magnificent call. Just let's listen to it all. The double play from an outfield assist in the postseason. So there's Harper's decision to try to push it and being caught so far away. And Riley's just can go as far as a lot of people think they, they will, which is all the way. We're looking at one of the most miraculous 45-minute stretches of, of anything that happened in Atlanta sports history. Let's start with that. <laughs> the, this team was being was just dead in the water. No hits through 15 innings, no hitter through six, and then we saw Riley hit a home run only the 13th time we've seen a go-ahead home run in the eighth inning or later in postseason history. With and then we have outs. an eight, five, three double play, which again is something else we've never seen in postseason history. We could talk about Harper and we talk about that decision, uh, you know, to, to go past second base and to get cut off and all that stuff. But what we're talking about is two miraculous plays here that saved the Braves season. And if they go to the World Series, like a lot of people think, they will pinpoint that as one of the reasons that they stayed alive. I think we all see what it says right behind you, Mr. Dennis, Atlanta, but you seem to think this is something that has carryover. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you seem to think that. Yeah, absolutely. It has a lot of carryover. Look, I was around all weekend and I saw the despair and the panic on the face of a lot of ATLians that carried over through the first half of that game. This gave the city and that team a whole lot of hope. George Dino bring you in here and what we just witnessed. Tony, what we witnessed is we should be giving Austin Riley a lot of credit. I'm not saying Bryce Harper doesn't deserve blame because I will give him plenty of that. We'll get to that in a second. But Austin Riley, that home run, and that play, that play in the field is as big as the home run, in my opinion. Now, let's get to Bryce Harper here. Bryce Harper knows more about, more, has forgotten more about baseball than I will ever know. But I'll tell you this, the basic rule of baseball when you're running the base, know where the ball is, Right. And when you're in that situation, you're supposed to be on the first base side of second base. You see on that play, he's about a third of the way down to third base. That, and then he slips, which causes an even bigger problem for him. But that's exactly why when you can't see the ball, you got to keep an eye on the ball. And he did a couple times kind of look over his shoulder, but he didn't keep an eye on the ball enough. So he wasn't able to get back. That play just Awful. Like, there's no other way to describe it. It is as big a bumbling error as you can make on the base pass in such a big spot that maybe we've ever seen in postseason history. And it's crazy because he's one of the best players we've ever seen in baseball. But I don't think it carries over. Philly got their split. I think they'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Frank, there's a lot to touch upon there. George just called it one of the biggest base running blunders in baseball history. There, there are historical blunders. Uh, <laughs> Merkel's boner, that's actually what it's been called for 100 years. Babe Ruth's been thrown out trying to steal to end World Series games before. Frank Isola, historically or just in the moment, what did we witness last night? It, in some ways, especially the play by Riley, reminded me a little bit. You knew I'd get the Yankees in here. The Derek Jeter flip play when Jeremy Giambi decided not to slide. That was a huge play. One thing about Bryce Harper, I think he was a little unlucky when he did slip. If he doesn't slip, chances are he does make it back to the base. But he knew he made a mistake because the minute he slid into the base, he knew he was out. He didn't do any fake arguing with the umpire like, how dare you call me out? Check the play. He knew he was wrong. But come on, to end a playoff game that way, that's a spectacular finish. And remember, to David's point, the Braves postseason – is almost on life support. They got to go to Philly and win both games to send the series back if they lose that game. That is a tremendous win. You believe in carryover, Frank Isola? No, no, I don't. It's it's all about. Come on, we all know that this is about pitching. It's that moment. Remember, going to Philadelphia. Look at the way that crowd was last week with the Marlins. That is a hostile, motivated, emotional crowd. And Marcel Louis Jacques. 
I mean, I, I don't have to say who's at blame. Bryce's own manager, Rob Thompson, said after the game, like, you have to be on the other side of second base. Like, that is just the rule. But it, it's kind of ironic here. I want to know what the third base coach was doing because we're not very far removed from Bryce blowing off the third base coach, scoring against the Marlins, and being the hero, being praised yeah, so for. That's so that's the point. Know what you this is how into. Harper plays, right? You can, you can understand that yeah. a little bit. Specifically, I, I, I want to – Drill down here on whether there's any carryover, Marcel. Any carryover? Uh, if anything, I think this inspires the Philly, the Philadelphia okay. Phillies. Like they're All going right. into one of the best home field advantages in the MLB. I think they've got something to prove. They're going to come out angry. I'm going to actually take the Phillies there in Game Three. I think they end up splitting, and the series goes back to Atlanta. George Susanna, back in. Tony, you said that that's how Bryce Harper plays, and yes, and that's why we love him. But there's a difference between being aggressive and being reckless, and he was reckless then. Mm, all right. We've been horned. We'll move on. The Diamondbacks. Let's talk about Arizona, what they've done this postseason, which is we play today, we win today. That's it. To come into L.A. after finishing 16 back in the division and take two off the Dodgers and be ahead nearly every pitch of this series, just stunning. And for L.A. to be paved over like they've been and some amulet in this series. That's stunning. George, whether this is more about what Arizona has done or what L.A. isn't doing and whether the Dodgers can even recover from it. Well, Tony, I do want to give credit to Arizona. The first third of the season, they were better than the mm -hmm. Dodgers. They mm -hmm. had a miserable middle of the season and then played much better late despite losing their last four games of the season. So they were a good team for being a young team pretty much all season long. Uh, they just had their ebbs and flows to it. The Dodgers pitching staff, though, they're starting pitching. They had problems before their issues with Julio Urias and his uh, domestic violence situation that's been alleged. And now, without him and without some of the other players that, they've, that they don't have in that rotation, Walker Buehler was a potential to be back in this rotation, and the doctors shut him down. Mm -hmm. With the pitching staff they threw out there, with all these young guys, with Clayton Kershaw continuing to struggle in the postseason, they're a mess. They're a mess in their starting rotation. A, their starting rotation, Tony, has an ERA of 40 through two games. As good as their bullpen has been in the back half of the season – they can't overcome this. They can't hit. Good pitching still beats good hitting most more times than not in Major League Baseball. Frank Isola. Yeah, and Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman aren't hitting. You know what's amazing? Over the last five years, the Dodgers have beaten the Diamondbacks 57 times in the regular season. And now here they are losing their first two games at home. And in the postseason, the way that baseball's developed now, or evolved, I should say, some people may, may say devolved, you only want your starter to go four or five innings. They can't even get their starters out of the second inning in the first two home games. you got to get some semblance of starting pitching. If you're the Dodgers, you are in huge trouble because you're not hitting, and that pitching, to George's point, is an absolute mess right now. Marcel Louis Jacques, do you believe the Dodgers have any recovery here? No, because two major events happened. One was the return of playoff Kershaw, which might be the most inexplicable case of the yips in major sports. This guy's postseason ERA, 4.49. It's one of the best pitchers of all time, continues to disappear in a bright spotlight. And number two, they made the tactical error of giving a young team hope. The Diamondbacks, only team in MLB history to score at least three runs in the first inning of back-to-back -back road games mm. in the postseason. Yeah, so you see what happens wow. when a team like that gets a little bit of momentum. Now it's carrying over into the desert. I don't see a way out of this for the Dodgers. David Dennis Jr., you? Home teams have lost the first two games 17 times in best of five series. They've only come back to win twice. That's bad news for this Dodger squad. They are, they've been trailed at the end of every inning in this series in the first two games so far. And this team seems like one that was shell-shocked by the way they started each of these games, allowing nine runs in the first two in innings in game one and game two. And to Frank's point, this is another yet another playoff time when the Dodgers have dominated a team in the regular season and looked terrible against that same team in the playoffs. This seems like a team-wide psychological issue that is going on. I'm not sure how they can recover from that in the next few days. Hey, George, you're in Los Angeles. Has it carried over to the fan base as well? Oh, Tony, the fan base is furious for a number of reasons. And look, I love Andrew Friedman. I think he's one of the smartest executives in all of sports. Dave Roberts could take a lot of grief for this, but this team was ill-constructed, okay? They had, need, they had pitching problems to begin with. They went out and got Lance Lynn, whose ERA is above five, when they needed pitching. They could have done a better job at the deadline, too.
We've been on. We'll take a break right here. Future is now in buy or sell. And the face of the future is at Connor Bedard. Game one tonight is NHL debut. We'll talk about that. And Victor Wembanyama made his preseason debut last night. Look at this. Missing a free throw just for Wembanyama to tip it in. That might be a new analytics play for San Antonio. <laughs> so that's a two for one. You take two points instead of one. Buy or sell next. A lot of guys miss free throws. Raiders 17, Packers 13. What you saw from the quarterbacks in this one, Jimmy Garoppolo's pick was unpleasant. Jordan Love's three were unattractive, unappealing, and unsightly. And a chance to kind of save it all at the end when Green Bay had a last gas. That was displeasing. Sports Illustrated clock is ticking on Garoppolo Love. It's week five and the clock is ticking. George, what do you buy? What do you sell from last night? I'm selling Garoppolo, too, Tony. This team, since 2010, is only the fifth team to score under 20 points in their first five games. Mm. Here's the good news, though. They've won two of those three. No team in that situation had ever even won a game. Their defense is so good, they deserve a better offense. you got to sell Garoppolo in this offense. They need a real quarterback in a division with Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert. David Dennis, Jr.? I'm selling the Jordan Love we've been seeing for the last couple of weeks. Five interceptions in two weeks. And the game plan supports a coaching staff that doesn't have a lot of faith in him. 3.1 air yards per pass. And when he passed the ball of more, for more than five yards, he was two for ten with three interceptions. I know it's early in the season. This team is really good minus the quarterback. This Packers team needs to figure out what they have with Jordan Love because, you know, they are, otherwise they're going to have to grab some, get somebody else in there to take this team to the next You're level. You're already going there after five games. Marcel Louis Jacques, is it too soon at five games? No, not for the Raiders, at least. I would express a little bit of patience if you're the Packers, but you know who Jimmy G was. This Raiders team, even though the defense has played okay, they were not a mediocre game manager away from being a playoff team or a contender. Jimmy G's, his winning record's great, 42 and 19, but wins are not a quarterback stat. He's averaging 195 passing yards per game in a league where difference makers are at the quarterback position. He is not a difference maker. You have to move on, especially if you're bad enough to grab one of these good quarterbacks in a great class. And Frank Isola, is five Man. games enough time to make an assessment? Man, you guys, you guys are tough. Thank God the producers of this show were more patient with me. Jimmy Garoppolo, didn't he <laughs> win a road playoff game in Dallas pretty recently and in Green Bay when he led them down the field for the winning uh, field goal? And Jordan Love's career is just starting out. Let the season breathe a little bit. I, I still think Jimmy Garoppolo, I get it with him. But you're in love. We used to be patient with young yeah. quarterbacks. Give the guy a chance. It's been five games for crying out loud. Fire sell, too. Let's talk some basketball. 14 and a half feet of preseason basketball last night. And it was Victor <laughs> Wemanyama's preseason debut. 20 points in 19 minutes, five rebounds a block. That tip in free throw for an extra point. I love that analytic play. I, I, I would miss him on purpose if he's going to be there. And look at the up and under here. And on the other side of the floor, Chet Holmgren, 21 points in 16 minutes. Nine boards, a block, and assist. David, what can you take away from preseason game one? <laughs> what I can take away from this is we are officially entering the science fiction era of the NBA, where if you show this clip to somebody 30 years ago, they think you used technology from Star Wars to create two seven-foot guys doing what they did. Wimby, that, that scoop layup started with a pump fake at the three-point line that somebody jumped at because it's that much of a three-point threat at that size. It is unreal what we're seeing, but I want to focus on Chet Holmgren because this season actually has higher stakes for him because that Thunder team is actually going to be pretty good. Got four players in the top 100 on ESPN NBA run. Rank. That team can make the playoffs, and there's a lot to depend on Chet Holgren, who had a lot of criticism for his size, who played well last night. I think that if he plays like that, this team can, you know, be a deep in the playoffs. Marcel Louis Jacques. Yeah, our own Richard Jefferson prior to this year's NBA draft said that if LeBron and Victor Wimbanyama, when they were 18, were in the same draft class, LeBron would go after Wemby. Like, that is a world of pressure on an 18 <laughs> year old. You can kind of understand a slow start to the summer league, plus the injury slowed him down. When asked about that up and under play last night, he said he's just freestyling. That's music to your ears if you're a San Antonio Spurs okay. fan. That means he's but playing. Do you crazy. believe the idea that that hype, that, that Richard Jefferson, you know, that was his opinion, that's fine. Do, do, you, do you think that's too much for a young player? 
I, yeah, I think it's too much, but it, it's because of what we know about LeBron James now. And we kind of forget in 03, LeBron James was really him at St. Vincent, yeah, St. Right. Mary's, but the tools that Victor has, man, it's- Frank Isola, what can you take away from preseason game one? Remember I said be patient with young players. Clearly, Victor is a bust. No, the guy, he looks so much better now than he did in Summer League. And I think being with the San Antonio Spurs organization even for a couple of months has helped him. When he scored over Chet Holmgren, I wish he had given him the too small because it would have been accurate. By the way, Chet Holmgren got to spend the whole season in an NBA environment last year. You can tell that's a big advantage for him. And George Dono. How many road playoff wins does Wemby have, Frank? Uh, No, all kidding aside. Listen, Chet Holmgren, to me, I think this is going to be a real competition for Rookie of the Year, Tony, and Scoot Henderson will be involved in that conversation as well. I think all these guys are going to be fine. What I think Holmgren has the advantage in is that he's put on those 15 pounds because he's been through an NBA offseason, and he looks bigger and stronger and can take that punishment perhaps a little better than Wemby can, uh, at least at this stage of their career, and he'll need it because there's real expectations on a Thunder team that should be in the playoff picture. Buy or sell three hockey. NHL opening night, banner raising for the champs. Vegas hosts the Kraken. But before that, Chicago Pittsburgh. This is intriguing for the debut of Connor Bedard. It's opposite Sidney Crosby, which is kind of cool. So the hype sky high for Bedard, the number one pick. And Emily Kaplan used a phrase in her piece today for ESPN.com, face of the league, because that matchup versus Crosby, who's been the face of the league for a generation. Connor McDavid, another face. And he set the bar in outer space for performance on the ice, but maybe there's more to your faciness, Frank. Can you be the face of hockey in your first game in the NHL? No, you can't, but you can be that in Chicago. And you think about Connor McDavid playing in Edmonton. You're playing in Edmonton, it's like you're on the other side of the world. But I would say this about being the face. To me, only Wayne Gretzky has been the face of hockey. He has a chance to be one of the faces. Lemieux, and then Ovechkin, and now Sidney Crosby. There's a lot of players. It's never just one guy in the end. Marcel Louis-Jacques? I don't know about that. I think Sidney Crosby was very much a face of hockey when he first came into the league. But uh, no, I think that Bedard can be everything in Chicago. $5.1 million in revenue within 12 hours after he was drafted. Chicago's desperate to get back to those Patrick Cade, Jonathan Tays days, and I think this is the guy to do it. But face of the league right now? I don't know about all that. David Dennis Jr.? I think it's a little early for face of the league, but he can make a lot of strides if he has this sort of passing the torch moment tonight with Crosby where he outplays everybody. But I think this year belongs to Connor McDavid and that Edmonton Oilers team. I'm, thanks for the geography lesson, Frank. But I think if you're the best player and you're making <laughs> a, a, a deep playoff run, then you can be the face of this league, and they're primed to do exactly well, that. Well, that would need the, the postseason win. George, go ahead. Tony, I, I don't know if I still realize this, but Wayne Gretzky hasn't played nearly 20 years, so he can't be the face of the league yeah, right now. The face of the league I is determined that by the, the, only the face, face of the league is determined by the fans, not gas bags like us. And if they want Bedard to be one of those guys, then he should be. Is he as good as McDavid or Austin Matthews or any of these guys at this point? No. But you know what? If the fans feel like he should be, then he should be. Mm-hmm. Tony, who's the face of the show? At the moment, who's not? we're going to decide that. David Dennis Jr., Frank Isola next. Junior Frank Isola, good luck in showdown. The latest on Justin Jefferson is not good. Injured reserve for his hamstring. He'll miss the next four games at least. Anthony Richardson, it's an AC joint injury. He's out this week, maybe more. Devon Achan, expected to miss multiple weeks with his knee injury. Matt Milano, Leighton Vanderish. It's just a brutal week in the NFL. This is a non-injury. How Jalen Hurts avoided injury on this play here is mystifying to me, but maybe something to monitor. And Kansas City, Travis Kelsey did practice today. That's ahead of Kansas City's Thursday game this week. Which injury stands to have the biggest impact on their team around the horn? David Dennis Jr. This is about Travis Kelsey to me. This is the second uh, leg injury they've had to deal with, and that Kansas City Chiefs, Offense looks totally different without him against that Detroit squad. Most importantly, is Taylor Swift going to be at these games if he doesn't show up? Right, guy, Sola. The Milano injury is big, but the Leighton Van Der Esch one is bigger. The Cowboys, their defense was so good at the start of the season. Now Diggs is out. Van Der Esch has a neck injury. They're saying four to six weeks. What is happening to Dan Quinn's defense? Frank Guy Sola, 30 seconds of FaceTime. 
We heard the, the sad news today of the passing of Brendan Malone, who was a New York basketball lifer, played at Rice High School in the Bronx, coached at Power Memorial. That's a school made famous by Lou Alcindor. He was an assistant coach for a number of college teams, pro teams, including Jeff Van Gundy in New York, Stan Van Gundy in Orlando. He was the first coach of Toronto. More than 20 years ago, I sat with him in a gym at Manhattan College to do a story on his son who was getting into the coaching profession. His son is Michael Malone, who just won the championship this season with the Denver Nuggets. I'm glad Brendan got to see that. That is sad news. Thank you for sharing, Frank Isola. Marcel, congrats on the engagement. Best to Haley. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you.